welcome to the Speaking Archaeologically lecture on object analysis. Now, before we begin, it becomes imperative to discuss what object analysis or artifact analysis, as some universities and some archaeological courses call it, means. Object analysis or artifact analysis is a scientific investigation of objects retrieved from an archaeological site. Bear in mind that whenever you look at an object and try to figure out what it is, that's a visual analysis. Whereas with object analysis, we're not just determining what the object looks like or what it possibly would have been, we are scientifically investigating into what it would have signified or what kind of importance it would have held in a particular archaeological period or in a particular context from where it has been retrieved. Now, depending on where the object is situated, object analysis can be of three types. The first type is in situ. In situ means situated where it was originally found, which means the object here is not removed from context. So, for example, in an ongoing excavation, you stumble upon something from the middle of the earth and you do not remove it from context, but photograph it. So that could be a piece of pottery shirt still embedded in the earth. You can see the surfaces or you can see the top. You photograph it and you start to analyze what it would have meant. That is an in situ object analysis. The second type of object analysis is on site. Here, the object has been removed from where it's found. So the particular trench or the particular place from where it has been found, it's, it's, it's been retrieved out of that. It's been cleaned and it is being an uh, analyzed in your fine stent. That's on-site analysis. Generally, on-site analysis is done in an archaeological report or in a primary report about what the object was, where exactly it was found, and if it's a special find, then mapping down the coordinates from where it has been found using a dumpy level. The third type of object analysis is post-excavation. So if you're studying anything that is in a museum and you are analyzing it, that's a post-excavation object analysis. In all the cases, object analysis is futile without context. So one thing which is imperative for us all to keep in mind is the context. The first requirement for analysis, therefore, is provenance or the place of origin or the earliest known history of something. And when you look at the provenance, it is essential to ask yourself whether or not the location of the object found influences its composition. For instance, if you found a pottery shirt from somewhere, it's imperative to ask yourself whether the clay that it's made of is found originally or was it imported from elsewhere. Are the materials of make locally available in that location? Or was the city a trade center of sort? Or was it a city center where such a thing would have been found? It's imperative to bear all that in mind when starting your object analysis and when looking at the provenance or the location or the earliest known origin of something. Uh, the next part will discuss approaches of artifact analysis. Now, how do you go about object analysis? How do you approach the topic of artifact or object analysis? Of course, the first thing, as I've already mentioned, happens to be photographing the object. And for photographing the object, it is advised that you take as many pictures of the object you're about to study as possible. Try to take multidimensional pictures of the object uh, from all visible sides of the object and make sure that you take one black and white and one in color for every image of the object. The reason why we take a black and white image of an object is because sometimes considering the modern cameras and the camera phones that we have before us, light has a very strong interplay on how the object will appear to naked eye. Sometimes the light, depending on whether you're photographing it in sunshine or you're photographing it in controlled light or within a museum, there are certain things that the light will enhance and others that the light will diminish. So in case of a black and white picture, the effect of light is completely negated. Now we come to the second step of object analysis or artifact analysis. Once you've taken the picture, it's important that you take down notes. Note down the measurements of the object. Why measurements are important? Now, most of the times measurements don't mean anything in case of an archaeological object. Of course, there's no reason as to why an object would measure the same as some other object that you found on site. 
but in case of indian archaeology particularly and also in case of certain other kinds of artifacts that you find a typology has been mentioned before so certain pots are cert have certain diameters or certain colors signify something and everything has a particular measurement it's particularly true in case of early medieval indian sculptures where a text called roop mandana defines how long and how wide a sculpture should be depending on what deity it's dedicated to you can search it up online it's easily available on archives.org stella cramrish has translated this and this is the bible for making all early medieval sculptures so whether you're dealing with uh chevite sculptures or secular sculptures or sculptures of devi or sculptures of any deity in particular there's certain specifications on how big the object could be and how long it could be in length and how wide it could possibly be D depending on whether it was a stand alone feature or a relief feature again there is specific dimension mentioned in roop mandana this is just one of the texts i am mentioning the four to five texts which govern measurements and based on that we can reach a typology about the types of a particular kind of sculpture that you can have that's not just true in case of indian archaeology it's also true in case of roman pottery where certain pots were supposed to measure a particular diameter or a particular radius and they could not be bigger than that they could not be wider than that so always remember to take measurements because in most of the archaeological stuff there is a typology which is always defined by the measurement of the object so measurements are very important so when you take your notes the first thing to do will be measure it it's always advised that whenever you go for an object analysis you should carry scales of sorts you should carry your regular scales and you should also carry measuring tapes if if possible and uh, also note down any damages while you're looking at the object now it's a historical object it's probably lying in a museum chances are it's damaged uh note down any di damages that you have from any dimensions from any angles be very specific from where the damage occurs is it damaged on the left is it damaged on the upper left corner is it damaged on the right is it damaged from below uh record them while looking at the object note this down in a diary always keep something at the ready while looking at objects note down the provenance if it's if particularly you're looking at an object in a museum you don't know where it's been excavated from so it's important for you to look at the provenance where was it found in what context was it found what does the museum catalog say about the object and if it's a museum object chances are it will have an accession number note down the accession number as well as descriptive details this will help place the object in the global archaeological context so that anyone who is looking at your research tomorrow this is particularly true in cases of re research or if anybody is looking at your database that you had created for object analysis they would know how to locate that object they would have the exact accession number so 50 years down the lane or 100 years down the lane if somebody wants to go and place that object that you talked about they will know exactly the accession number and where to find it from or what museum to take it up from and in case it's lost it's easier for people to point out where the, there was an object with that accession number which the museum does not have any longer so you're reducing chances of archaeological theft by noting down the accession number of an object available at a particular site now the third thing which is imperative in object analysis after you've taken down the basic notes you've done your basic research noted down what an object signifies how much it measures where was it found were there any damages you start looking for parallels a lot of you would have come across the term parallels particularly from my end because that's one thing i always stress on you people doing go find a parallel do you does, does this object have a second does it have a twin somewhere how do you find a parallel now finding parallels first of all this is just to explain what a parallel means isn't finding an object with a similar theme or a purpose when i talk about similar themes or purpose i insist the first you look up for object which is chronologically a parallel so say it's a shiv parvati sculpture from the 13th century so you're looking at one try and look at other shiv parvati sculptures from the 13th century so you have a chronological typology what did they look like next map the geographical area from where they've been found so again group the objects found from a similar location similar geographic location for instance 
the Shiv Parvati sculptures from Himachal Pradesh would be one typology. And then you start looking into Shiv Parvati sculptures from Haryana and then from Punjab area, then from Rajasthan perhaps, and then from Odisha. So you have different typologies. There is a chronological order, then there is a geographical order. Now you can compare the similarities and differences in these. So 13th century Shiv Parvati sculptures from Himachal can be compared with those in Haryana, Rajasthan, Punjab and Odisha, as I've mentioned. Also look for the, the chronological parallels from the same museum before you begin this. So first of all, look for all the parallels. After you've done that, look into parallels from any other museums in the area and then mapping down all those parallels and keeping them at the ready for for reference once you've done this look for their mentions in literary sources of the time so are there any texts that refer to that particular sculpture or are there any texts that refer to the place that sculpture has been retrieved from or are there any texts like Roop Mandana which give you any specifications of a particular thing again I'm talking too much sculpture but Similar things can also be done with ca in case of jewellery, in case of other things. For instance, if you're looking at nuts or nose rings that we have in North India, Ayane Akbari gives you a detailed account of the kind of nose rings women wear in India. And different names for different types of nose rings, which varies because of their diameter and their purpose and where they're worn socially. So that kind of literary mention for nose rings will serve as a canon for us studying nose rings and see if the classification given by a particular author still holds true or is it a false classification or because it's a foreign person looking at something which is native does the classification change or does the class is the classification faulty so that sort of thing you must find a literary source and you must find if there are any information in a literary source about a particular kind of object and its typology if you are in a museum and you're trying to find parallels within the same museum and then from a sister museum, your next step should be to find out where the recorded parallels are housed elsewhere. So does the museum record if they have any records about where a similar object was sent perhaps? In order to broaden your scope for this, you can also do today an image search which is available to us online. So use, make use of technology for object analysis. Just because you're studying any antiquated object does not mean your approach has to be antiquated. Make use of technology before you. Perform a Google image search if, if that's all it takes and then start recording parallels. Image search will show you how many of these objects which are similar in theme or similar in appearance are housed in other museums. If they're housed in private collections which are open to public like Frick's collection for example, they will have an accession number as well. Also, if they have uh, been acquired by other museums, the British Museum, the Met Museum, for instance, again, they will have an accession number. Once you've looked, once you've found the parallel, make repeat step two here, take notes. Uh, note down the measurements, if available, generally museums do that. They give you the measurements of the, of the object. Notice any damages that you can see from the available images from the museum gallery. Of course, you cannot have the multidimensional aspect here, but you can still see the visible damages on the surface. As many as you can record, make notes of them. And then note down their accession number, which is also provided to you by museum websites. To strengthen your analysis, try to include as many parallels from museums and private collections worldwide. So don't just limit yourself to a particular place. Make it very strong. Try to make it extremely well researched before you move on to something else. Last step after doing all this is make a database. You can, depending on your technological know-how or depending on your personal uh, convenience, make a database online or you could make it in a spreadsheet or you could make it by hand if needed and use that as a reference point for all your research. It's always advised to make a database so that you can see it all in typological order. You have the measurements before you, you have the, the object's accession number before you, you have the location of the object before you, and you have all the similarities and differences mapped out in that particular table or that particular database. That just gives you more context and it just makes it easier for you to look at all that in one go. Right, now that we've discussed all the approaches to object analysis, I will now stress on points to remember. Make sure that you've noted this down because without these, chances are you will make grave errors in your analysis of an object. And since this is a scientific analysis 
and the scope for errors is really, really minimized. Make sure that you remember this every time you attempt object analysis. So number one is always make note for your criteria of identification of an object. Why do you say a particular thing is what it is? For instance, I'm looking at a jewelry object. If I say it's a bangle or it's a it's a wrist ornament, what is my criteria for identification of that? Does the provenance say that? Do I agree with what the provenance says? Do I agree with what the muse museum catalog or the descriptive detail on the display says? Or is it just my own deduction that that is what it is and that's what it would have been used for? The second thing to do is, in case you're studying a sculpture or a painting, ensure that you've noted down the scene or the type of setting a particular thing is trying to depict to you. So is a sculpture religious in nature or is it secular in nature? Is it trying to show you a religious scene? Is the religious scene straight out of some mythological text or some kind of epic? Is it depicting a procession? Is it depicting a festival? Is it depicting something which is domestic? So always note down the setting. I hope I've made my point clear with all the examples I've given you. Number three, in case any object shows any human forms or figures, pay special attention to the following. If it's a human depiction, does it have a headgear? If so, what kind of headgear is it? Is it wearing a diadem or a crown or just a circlet perhaps of sorts? Also note down the number of figures in the depiction. Is the figure all alone? Or is it flanked by something else, by animals or by trees or by other human forms, males or females, for instance? Note down the state of nudity and clothing of these figures. So if they're clothed, identify as many articles of dress as you possibly can with their specific names. So call a dhoti a dhoti, call a yajno pavit a yajno pavit. Uh, note down any ornaments that you might see on the on, on the figure and what they're called if you can identify them even better the more specific you are the more detailed your analysis is talk about the type of clothing talk about the posture of the main figure specifically in the Indian context you have a lot of postures you have different mudras if you can identify the different mudras in which a sculpture has been depicted Buddhist sculptures particularly have different hand mudras uh, Indian sculptures have different standing mudras, which is Abhanga mudra, Tribhanga mudra, Dvibhanga or Sambhanga mudra. There's so many different kinds of mudras. I've just mentioned four here. So always note down the posture of the main figure if possible. Number four, always analyze the utility and the purpose of the object. Remember that your object analysis is futile if you do not note down what the utility of the particular object was. Was it an object intended to be placed in a public area, for instance? This is particularly true if you're looking at a painting or if you're looking at a sculpture. Try to identify where the object was placed. Was it placed in a public area? Was the area open for reception or was it for a non-reception area? Was it private? Was it depicted in a facade or a pillar or was it within a wall was it a part what kind of relief was it a part of was it an external or an internal relief that sort of deduction can also be made by looking at the wear and tear on the object for instance in case of certain things paintings particularly even sculptures to some extent you can tell if it's been subjected to environmental damage now in some cases the environmental damage would have occurred because of where the object was buried but in most of the cases you can tell if there's a decoloration or if there's a certain chunk of it missing you can say whether the object was outside or inside a particular structure try to identify where it would have been placed second always try to make a note of whether the object was utilitarian or did it have a religious or symbolic purpose so for instance if you're looking at a bowl does it look like a ritualistic bowl to you or does it look like a bowl which would have been used to serve food number three look at whether or not it was an art form what was the object being made as a result of an art movement if yes how widespread or limited that art movement was or was it commonly found among the masses or was it the kind that was patronized this is particularly true if you're studying embroidery or you're studying particular kinds of uh, textile related art like chamba rumals or fulgari for instance was it widespread did the women of a particular area practice it or was, was it something that had to be patronized by the king or a patron and was it being commissioned? So miniature paintings, for instance, were being commissioned by people in high status. 
chamba rumals and fulkari on the other hand were being made as a part of wedding trousseau in almost every other house in a particular area so that is very important to analyze the kind of art form it would have been lastly check does the object have any legacy in the present day is it still prevalent as an art form is it still prevalent as a handicraft has it gone completely that sort of thing will help you establish a relationship that just makes things even better if you can link your thing with the present your analysis is practically speaking flawless right now you've gathered all the data imaginable what do you do with all that data so after you have all your parallels in one place and you have all the the basic notes in one place you've analyzed a bit of what would what, what the object signified or what was its purpose tabulate the percentage of parallels to ascertain their popularity so how many parallels had a particular dimension or were similar to each other see if you can tabulate it the more mathematical you make it the more analytical your research becomes this will help you determine the possible usage the possible significance and the popularity of a certain object also it's advised that after this stage similar objects found in contemporary cultures of a period elsewhere are studied and compared with so always after this stage after you've tabulated the percentage of how many were found from where and how similar they were and what their popularity was like after you've done that try comparing it with other cultures and other civilizations for instance if you're dealing with punjab the malwa and the majha region and you pick up an object which was being uh, handed down generations in the malwa region see if the majha region does something similar or if they have a similar object and then study the patterns of how it was being socially moved or economically moved for that matter if you're looking at the himachal region where you have the western himalayas where you have a dogra dominant population and then you have the eastern himalayas where you have the pahadi culture dominant and you have something which is similar in both the cases see how it was being handed down in each society is the object a result of cultural interaction between two different tribal groups or is it natively found or did they both originate independently and then compare as to whether the object being analyzed the thing that you're looking at is unique or the practices associated with it are prevalent in other cultures in other countries as well in case of parallels following falling in the same date range look and specifically in other countries or contemporary civilizations for instance you find a piece of pottery in the harappan culture and you find something similar in the egyptian culture of that time see what angles you can take your research to can you can you possibly map down a trade route and see what the economic trends were like was the object being traded was it being introduced into a particular civilization through trade or was it a political activity that led for of led one object to be carried off to another place this is something that we've investigated ourselves when we talk about invasions ethno archaeology and migration so did a foreign culture because it was traveling and ruling over a different culture did it bring things with itself and start dominating the way something was being manufactured basket weaving is an exemplary uh, instance of how political activities can dominate the manufacture of a product it's say it's the same with fashion styles or jewelry the way a language is being spoken if it's being spoken the same way as the natives is what was the influence of a particular foreign rule over that particular area that's something we apply linguistically as well so apply the same thing to the objects that you are studying